Okay, let's, uh, as you make your way in, open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we are continuing uh, our study on how to obtain fullness of power. We're looking at the power of the Holy Spirit and specifically at the gifts of the Holy Spirit and trying to uh, understand what they are and how they operate so we would recognize the ones that we have so that we can be actively using them. And we skipped uh, in this list, uh, we've covered the whole list uh, from 1 Corinthians, but we skipped uh, the one that Paul says is the most important one. We're saving it uh, for last. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. Well, I guess we could read the whole thing. Verse 7 is where it starts. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, there's ours, to another the discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. So... Uh, the gift of prophecy tonight is our topic. This section uh, from chapter 12, 13, and 14 that Paul's focused on uh, trying to help the Corinthians understand what the gifts are and how to use them. It's where we have the famous chapter 13 about love. It's not really in a section about marriage. It's in a section about church life. So uh, love is patient, love is kind. You know, the famous section is, is, is really in the instructions on using your gift, that the that love is more important. If you have the gift of prophecy or you had wisdom and you had knowledge or you had faith and you could move a mountain, if you don't have love, it doesn't mean anything. And then in, especially in chapter 14, and we'll look at several verses tonight before we're finished, uh, he, he contrasts the two gifts, tongues and prophecy. So uh, we're not really going to be going through this verse by verse, but that was the list that we read and the one that we have left is prophecy. A simple definition of prophecy is found in chapter 14 uh, when he's contrasting it with tongues. If you remember verse 2, we looked at the gift of tongues last time I was with you. It says, he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. So that's a tongue. A tongue is directed not towards people. It's not a message that someone would be given, which they don't understand, but they deliver it by the Spirit and the message is for people. Paul says that it's for God. He's speaking not to men, but to God. And then he explains, no one understands him. In the spirit, he speaks mysteries. But look at verse 3. Here's a definition of prophecy. He who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. So hopefully we'll demystify the idea of prophecy. And it's important that we do because I've been a Christian now for almost uh, 30 36 years almost, and I've seen the, a revival, uh, or I, I remember in the 80s there was this sort of thing, these guys say they're prophets, they're the prophets, and they're the ones, and you got to listen to them, and then of course that's not true, and those guys end up proving to not be prophets the way that they want to be thought of as prophets, and then it, that teaching sort of falls away for a while, but it seems like everyone forgets about it, and then it comes back up again, so I think I'm getting older because I I was just uh, saw something a few months ago, and uh, it was the same thing again. I think it's the third time now, so I must really be old to see the same false doctrine make its way around. Uh, you know, it's where well, you have a birthday, right? Every time the Earth goes around the Sun, it takes a year. Is that true? Is that how it works? Something like that—a year for us to go around. That's how we have a year. Is that true? I'm jet lagged. I could be wrong, right? Like that's how we mark a year. It means we've gone around the Sun. It takes us one year to go around. So. These, some of these false doctrines, that it takes a while for us to get all the way around, but then they come back. And, uh, you know, it's the, there's a group of men will say, we're the ones, God's going to speak through us, the rest of y'all, you need to listen to us. And uh, it has the smell of arrogance and pride. And so when you, when you hear a person and you have the sense in your spirits, maybe it's even discerning spirits, you have some sense of, and this doesn't seem right, but we all have to listen to this, They're, these are the ones... You know, that sounds like the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Watchtower Society. They're the only ones that Jesus appeared to. They're the only ones that know. They're the ones that will tell the rest of us. Or it sounds like some other form of, you know, aberrant, uh, some other version of Christianity or some other kind of a cult. 
And uh, when you see some, something like that creep into the evangelical part of the church where, listen, we are all connected to Jesus. There's one mediator between God and man. But the human nature seems to always want to sort of create some kind of a hierarchy. And this particular gift, or even the office, we'll talk about that a little bit tonight, the office of a prophet or the gifting to be able to have the gift of prophecy as though uh, you know that that separates somebody and now they can be uh, the one that you have to consult in order to know what you ought to do. Uh, I think the one you consult in, in order to know what to do, his name is Jesus. And if you ask him, he'll give you wisdom. <laughs> and, and he's the friend that sticks closer than a brother and there's no replacement for him. So if he's speaking something to you, God might use somebody else to confirm that, but he, Jesus is not going to be replaced by any person. So I think this is a fantastic and perfect and very simple definition of the gift of prophecy. And I think that since this is my opinion, Paul says this is the best gift for the body of Christ. And my experience with God is that he is very economical, he doesn't, he, he's very smart, he's very wise. This is the best gift for the body of Christ. It's my assumption that this is probably the most common gift also. Now, the thing about the gift of prophecy is uh, sometimes there's a person who says they have it, but they act so weird that it makes you feel like, I am never going to say that I have that gift. I knew someone who said they had that gift, and I want to be as far away from what they're like as possibly, uh, you know, that I could possibly be. Uh, because they were just so bizarre in their behavior. I've met people uh, just acted so weird, uh, you know, almost like their eyes are going in different directions, or they're imagining things, they're telling you stuff. And I've, I've had people say, I'm going to prophesy over you, and they start telling me, and, and, and the Holy Spirit's speaking to me the whole time they're talking. Don't listen to a word they're saying. They're, they're back crazy. Maybe he didn't say back crazy, but, uh, you know, the thought was in my head of, like, this isn't me speaking to you. So then you've got a person who you know is a believer, they're a Christian, I'm not judging their faith, but I'm definitely judging their message. And, have it, and I have the Holy Spirit living inside of me. The Bible says don't believe every spirit, but test the spirit. So you could have an experience where someone is demonstrative or they're, uh, they're acting in a certain way. And so we have the old phrase, you want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. So look, that was such a weird thing. I'm never going to you know, say anything like that or believe that that even exists because that was so bizarre. Uh, we don't want to do it because this is a wonderful thing. When someone's using the gift of prophecy, what happens to people? Well, look at the three words. They're edified. What does that mean? It means built up. When the gift of prophecy is in operation, people are built up. They got strengthened. They were, they were, in, they were infused with new energy. They had new vision. They, they were filled with hope. They were hopeless, they had hope. They were joyless, they had joy. They were weak, they became strong. It was just, whatever it was lacking, some kind of thing from the Lord, you know, whatever, whatever it was that they needed came through what the person shared. They're built up. The other word, exhortation, and the other word, comfort. Both of those words are very similar. Uh, one of them is the word that's the one that Jesus uses to describe the Holy Spirit, the one who comes alongside to help this gift there's also a gift of exhortation, but prophecy includes that uh, aspect. Exhortation means someone's kind of struggling in their journey, and the message comes alongside them, and they're helped in their journey. Maybe if you didn't want to run a marathon, but you agreed to uh, man the water station at mile 18, right at the top of the hill, you know, and you're cheering the people up and you're handing them water cups and little goo containers and, and like, come on, you can do it. That's exhortation. This is the, that's the water station. Like, you're doing great. Here's some Gatorade. You know, keep going. Who doesn't want that gift? I mean, this is the person that comes alongside to help or to encourage or to uh, spur on, if you will. It's not really a negative uh, term. It's very positive. Uh, so building up, encouraging, coming alongside and help, that's the gift of prophecy. I think most of you probably have some level of the use of this gift. This is a great gift. Uh, it's the ability when you're, when you're talking to somebody, a thought comes into your head, 
an application of the scripture, something that you recently read, you heard what the person was saying, and all of a sudden you went, wait, that reminds me. And the thought came and you said, you know what, that's a lot like, and you shared with them what you were thinking. It was, it was straight from the Lord. And they heard it and they went, wow, thanks for sharing that with me. They were built up. They were encouraged. That's the gift of prophecy. You don't have to grow out your beard, get crazy eyes, carry a staff, and wear, you know, Jesus hair. I'm describing a guy that I knew many years ago who walked on Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa's property dressed exactly like Jesus from a Jesus movie. Full on white robe, long Jesus hair parted down the middle. You know, he just looked exactly like a movie actor. I mean, he has sweet beard. And, and Jesus' sandals on, he had like these homemade sandals that he, that he had, and he came walking on the property, and I, you know, we had a grammar school on the property, we had hundreds of kids there, and so part of all the maintenance guy's job, you'd always have one eye open, we we're on a big boulevard, you know, at the south end of, uh, I guess maybe the west end, southwest end of Santa Ana, and uh, you see what, you see, we'd have different people come on, you have to be on guard, and like at least minister to them and help them so they wouldn't wander into where the kindergartners are. So I walked up to the guy, first words out of his mouth, I'm a prophet. First words out of my mouth, I could tell by your clothes. <laughs> Listen, if your clothes are given it away that you're a prophet, something's wrong with you. Okay, I'm just be frankly honest. Be, the gift of prophecy should not make you weird. You don't have to be afraid of it. The gift of prophecy makes people built up and, and encouraged and strengthened and like they get, a, they get a boost, you know? You're able to come alongside and give them something that helps them keep going. I think this, one, this is the one that happens all the time. I'm, I'm praying for this to happen every time I teach the Bible. I'm praying for this gift to happen every time we break and start having fellowship with each other that all of you would have this gift as you're fellowshipping and visiting with each other. That you'd be able to talk about what's going on in your life, and then, you know, you have that thought, and you think, oh, yeah, well, let me share with you what I read, you know, and you're listening, you're getting built up, you're getting encouraged. That's, that's the gift of prophecy. So we want to demystify it. Now, of course, if we look, think of the book of Acts, there's uh, the Old Testament prophets. So in the New Testament, we have people who are called prophets, referring to the Old Testament prophets. So uh, just I'll, you can look at them if you want, but Acts 2.16, maybe if, maybe if you start in Acts, we can just go through this quickly. I'm not going to really explain these, but just as a reference point, just how many prophets are mentioned in the book of Acts. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 16, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So Joel's mentioned. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 30, uh, speaking about David, Verse 29, he mentions David. He says, therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ. So David is also called a prophet. The Old Testament revelation in a number of places refers to the law and the prophets or the prophets said. There's a bunch of verses, several in, in chapter 3, verse 18, for example, these things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ would suffer, he's fulfilled. Verse 21, uh, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his prophets. And then verse 24, yes, and all these prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have foretold these days. So the Old Testament prophets now are being named as a group, but we've also had Samuel mentioned there uh, directly. He'll be mentioned also later in chapter 13. Uh, Isaiah is mentioned as a prophet, chapter 7. Uh, of course, he's, these are in quotations of the Old Testament. Um, chapter 7, verse 48. He's getting ready to set up this. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me? That prophet is Isaiah, uh, and also that's a partially a quotation from a psalm. Um, also, chapter 8, verse 28, about the Ethiopian eunuch, when Philip joined the chariot, he said he was sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Why would someone be reading Isaiah the prophet? Well, 
God's foretold these things by the mouth of his prophets. God spoke by his prophets. God's delivering a message to the people. The prophets are the ones that he uses to deliver that message. Chapter 13, we already got the one for Samuel. And there's another one in chapter 13 for Samuel, verse 20. After he gave them about, he gave them judges for about 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And then uh, verse 40, chapter 13, verse 40. Beware, therefore, lest what has been spoken in the prophets come upon you. Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish. I will work a work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you. That's Habakkuk. So Habakkuk is a prophet, called a prophet in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 15, verse 15. And these are the words uh, uh, James giving his reason for why they don't need to go back to the law. Uh, the, with these words of the that with, with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, and he has a quotation from Amos. Amos is a prophet. And then Isaiah, look at the book of Acts. It ends, if you go all the way to the end of Acts 28, it ends actually with a prophet. Uh, Paul is there in prison in Rome. There's a group of Jewish people that come, and of course, as what always happens, he preaches the gospel, and the group is divided. Some are wanting to hear more, and they're interested they're thinking of believing. Others don't believe, and they immediately become you know, frustrated, and there's a separation. And then Paul quotes. He says in verse 25 uh, from Isaiah, he says, When they did not agree among themselves, they departed after Paul said one word. The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah the prophet to our fathers. Then there's this quotation from Isaiah, Paul's explanation of it, and then the conclusion of the book. So the, the book of Acts is filled with... This phrase, the prophets, the prophets, the prophets. Joel, David, the prophets as a group, Isaiah, Samuel, Habakkuk, Amos, I, and another Isaiah. Um, so several different prophets mentioned. So when we think of the Old Testament prophets, well, some of them did kind of uh, interesting things. Uh, Ezekiel did some demonstrative things. One of them was told by God to marry a prostitute and that the kids that she would have would not be his kids, and so they were supposed to be named not mine. I mean, that's not a good thing to name your kid. I mean, so you could go back and look at the Old Testament and say, well, this is the model, and these guys, are, there's some interesting behaviors that are outside the norm. Uh, but when you look in the New Testament, you don't see those things. Um, there, there is a de demonstration by one of the, the prophets who foretells that Paul would be bound where he takes Paul's belt and binds himself. But other than that, there's nobody acting weird. And when Paul describes the gift of prophecy in 1 Corinthians 13, I mean 14, he, he describes something that's very beautiful, very simple and wonderful and probably is happening all the time. We just don't acknowledge it. I, after I got saved, and I, under, I, I, never, I went to Bible college. We didn't believe in the gifts. I remember finally studying through 1 Corinthians and looking at the passage and then I got to that verse that explained the gift of prophecy, and I thought, we don't believe in the gift of prophecy, and we're using it all the time. <laughs> but we just give ourselves credit, like, well, what a great memory you have, or what, that's a great way you applied that scripture. Well, how about we just say it was the Lord? How about the Lord reminded this person and, it, and gave them the exact thing that this person needed? Why not give God the glory? It was a gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's not a gift, though, that's going to let you control somebody. So, uh, we'll, we'll end up talking about that more. I'll give you a, we'll, t we'll sort of end with a bit of a warning, but not, I'm not afraid of your use of the gift, but I want to help you if someone tries to use their gift or their calling to sort of rule over your life. God forbid. So the word prophet is used to identify those who under the old covenant were used by God to bring revelation to his people. Under the old covenant, they were used by God to bring revelation to the people. Now, Moses, who was also a prophet, Moses calls himself a prophet. Moses foretold, he said, the Lord your God, he spoke to Israel, the book of Deuteronomy, the Lord your God will raise up a prophet for you who is like me. So remember when they came to John the Baptist and said, who are you? Are you the Messiah? And he said, I told you I'm not the Messiah. They said, what then? Are you the prophet? They knew their Bibles. They knew that the Messiah was coming, and they knew that this person that Moses said, a prophet, is coming who's going to be like me. Now, Jesus is like Moses in the sense that 
He brought a new covenant. Moses brought a, the covenant through the law. Jesus brought the covenant through his blood. And he becomes the great high priest, and the sacrifice is now the sacrifice of his own life. And he enters not into a tabernacle or a temple on earth, but he enters into heaven itself to obtain redemption once and for all. So in a sense, hey, whatever Moses was, Jesus is that and infinitely more. And he fulfills that. Uh, but he is the prophet. He's the prophet that Moses was talking about. And actually, uh, there's a reference, two references to that in the book of Acts as well. <clears throat> For your notes, if you want them, Acts 3.22 and Acts 7.37. Now, in the New Testament, we do have some that are called prophets. They're not uh, prophets in the sense that we have them bringing uh, what we would you know, call the uh, the revelation of God, that was going to be brought through the apostles. Um, but the, the, found, the church in the New Testament, we're told is the church is laid on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. So there is a sense in which, as we had the 12 apostles, there, there was a unique season for the delivering of the word of God, uh, that the, and the word of God is complete. So we're not looking for prophets today to tell us something that the word of God doesn't tell us. Peter says really clearly, everything you need for life and godliness is given to you in the scriptures. So the gift of prophecy, though, is, is going to be the expression of the Holy Spirit uh, through a person, uh, most of the time using the word of God, uh, to speak directly to someone's life that they would know that it was God speaking to them. There's no way for a human being to do this. A human being cannot do this. Now, there might be someone at the carnival, a mentalist, who can say, there's someone here tonight, I know you're ex someone's experienced loss. Wait, I know it's, it's, a, it's a parent. Wait, it's a, it's a mother, isn't it? And you just look at the audience faces and like, it's, she's just died recently and the person's like, not too long ago. You know, I mean, it's just, it's just reading a crowd. I mean, everybody in this room has suffered, I mean, you know, if you, there's a few generalities you could pick uh, and it's fake, right? Or, you know, a a fake seance or fake whatever, uh, or at, at worst, something demonic where the demons are knowing something that really nobody could know except for somebody who had supernatural knowledge. And I don't think the demons are uh, afraid to do that. They you know, were warned against that. This gift is, is, is a tremendous blessing to the body of Christ. When somebody has the gift of prophecy, they may not even know that they're using the gift. They're in a conversation, and they say something a certain way, and they didn't even realize how it was going to touch a person's life. Uh, it happens all the time. This is one of my gifts. I think uh, probably this is the gift uh, that operates the, along with discernment, discerning spirits. This is one that operates the most strongly in my life. And I have every single Sunday, somebody walks up to me, and they'll say, I don't know, I was going to call you, but I don't need to call you now. You, everything that you, you knew exactly, and I'm like, oh, yes, because that's how awesome I am. Because I was thinking of you all week, I was actually stalking you online, gathering lots of data on you, interviewed your friends, catered my message around to try to just touch that one spot and figure it out. That's impossible. Nobody could do that. But we're praying for that to happen in the Sunday school class with the little kids. And we're praying for that to happen in the conversations after the church service is over, that people don't just pew, blow out the door, but just start to talk to their friend with an open heart. And Lord, you know, I'm abiding with you. I'm expecting you to speak to me. Uh, and, and, and I want to minister to my friends and not trying to manufacture something, but just believing and trusting God that as we fellowship together, the gifts are going to operate. And you'll be talking to somebody. You've had probably friends that would say, man, that... When you said that the other day we were out for coffee, that was exactly what I needed to hear. And then you're thinking, I talked about myself the whole time. When, what could I, I, like, I was about to apologize that I wouldn't shut up about my own problems. Like, wait, what part was, and, the, and, the, and maybe they even tell you what you said, and you're like, no, I didn't say that. Uh, but you said something that was like that. The Lord used it. It touched their heart in a way. It was a, it's a gift of prophecy. Uh, you don't have to have the, the tinglys, you know, the hairs on the back. You're like, or you don't have to start speaking in Old King James. Thus saith the Lord, he's come here. You know, uh, once it gets weird to me, uh, I have a strong gift of discernment, so I get the sirens going off. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Danger, you know. So 
in the New Testament gift of prophecy, a lot of times when people think of prophecy, they think of telling the future, right? We have many prophecies of the Messiah, over 300 in his first coming, over 300 about his second coming. There are prophecies, lots of prophecies. We use that word, rightly so, because God spoke this out, and, they, the, and this is one of the ways for God to validate and prove that the scriptures are given by him. He tells what's going to happen before it happens, and he tells it exactly, 100%, perfectly, with no flaw, so that once it comes to pass, you'll have to say, man, the Bible is the word of God. No one else could do that. But most of the time, for us, we're going to see the 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3. It's not, he didn't say foretelling the future. He said edification and exhortation and comfort for men. Foretelling can be, be a part of it. Uh, let's look at the book of Acts now, back to chapter 11. We'll look at some of the people called prophets. So the first one is, uh, there's a group of prophets, and one in particular, uh, Agabus. So Acts chapter 11 I'm sorry, I went to the wrong place. Where is, which chapter is that? Must be, when does Agabus come? See, this is what happens when I rely on my notes and I don't just memorize it. Agabus. 11.27, is that right? Oh, I'm in the wrong chapter. That's why it doesn't look right. It is 11.27. It doesn't say that in 10.27, though. Thanks, bro. 11.27, in these days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Can I let, have a, let's just let you a confession right now? My personal experience in the church, when I read that phrase, I go, oh, great. Because of my personal experience with people who claim that they're prophets. I know that they're going to come, and now they're going to set themselves up, and they're going to be telling everybody, blah, 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 and they came from Jerusalem, <laughs> Jerusalem, big shots. Uh, I'm ready to scrap. As soon as I read that verse, I'm like, all right, Tom, let's meet him at the door. Like, check these guys out. They're prophets. Like, oh, great. But, you know, that's my, my experience has been with people who want to elevate themselves. I've got a spiritual gift. If you really want to know what God's will is, we're the ones that can tell you. Um, this isn't bad, so that's my personal bias. I told you I was going to let you in on a confession. That was my confession. One of them, verse 28 one of them named Agabus, and we'll learn about him also later. He, he shows up again, and both times in a, in a way of foretelling the future, he stood up, he showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. And the disciples recognized, they, they judged it, they, they accepted it, and they began, it says, each according to his ability, they determined to send relief to the brethren who were dwelling in Judea. And they did this and sent it um, with, uh, to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So Barnabas and Saul are going to make a trip down to Jerusalem. And, uh, and part of it's related to Agabus. Uh, the Jerusalem church was already starting to suffer. It's going to get worse. They'd already been persecuted. They've had a lot of hardships. And then now there's going to be this famine. And so they think, well, let's, let's get on board. Let's try to, you know, these guys are in trouble anyway. Let's bless them. And and this thing actually came true. Um, also, he's mentioned in chapter 21. So as long as we're talking about him, let's jump forward to chapter 21. Twenty-one verse ten. We'll come back to this chapter later because there's other prophets who are mentioned here. Uh, but verse ten says, "We stayed many days there. A certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea." And when he came to us, he took Paul's belt, he bound his own hands and feet, and he said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. So he's foretelling these events. He foretold that there would be a famine, which did happen. And what happens? We read about it in the book of Acts. When Paul, Paul's determined to go to Jerusalem, and he goes, and what Agabus said happens. So he's right. We, we read about this one guy two times. Nobody else, though, by the way, but two times, one particular guy, he does foretell the events accurately, but notice what happens. Look at the response. Look at verse 12. When we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. So 
the message is, whoever, the guy who owns this belt is going to be bound, and he's going to suffer greatly in Jerusalem. There's no application with it, but everybody else hearing that message, they make an application, which is, Paul, don't go. And Paul says, verse 13, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, the will of the Lord be done. So they went down there. Um, interesting that uh, Paul, in his trip to Jerusalem, uh, he was free to determine his, his own course of action. The prophet says, this is what's going to happen. Paul says, and really, to be perfectly honest, you remember when he tells the, uh, the Ephesian elders on the beach, he says, the Holy Spirit testifies to me, bonds and afflictions wait for me in every city. So the prophet comes up and says, this is what's going to happen. And Paul goes, every city I go to, I get the same message, bro. <laughs> like, you think, I, you think I'm already on this journey and God hasn't already told me the suffering that I'm going to have? Sometimes I've had people come up to me and they go, I think I've got a word for you. And they share with me and they're, you know, maybe they're even nervous about saying, I understand the nervousness and all of that. But I usually smile and I'm thinking, yeah, the Lord's been telling me that for four years. Like, I mean, so if you get something to share with somebody, don't elevate yourself. Because at best, God's going to have already confirmed to the person. God doesn't, if God's going to speak to you, there's just a simple analogy. God has your cell number. He has your own personal cell number. If he wants to send you a message, God will speak to you. He, if you're struggling, God might send somebody else to bring a confirmation. God might send somebody, maybe you've never thought of it. Maybe it's way outside what you've been thinking. And God sent someone to sort of prime the pump, if you will, or to sort of present the idea. If someone tells you something, you say, well, that's very interesting. Thank you for sharing that with me. I totally appreciate that you are willing to come up. That's kind of bold of you. And I think, thank you for loving me so much that you're willing to share that with me. And then you pray about it. And if God throws it in the waste can, so to speak, if, you just, if it just doesn't, like, I don't know, I pray, I don't know. Then don't worry about it. It doesn't matter if it's me, okay? But like, well, he's the pastor. He just said, he's hot, maybe. Oh, oh, oh. God's not telling me that, but he said I should do it. Oh, no. Don't do it if I tell you to do it. The Lord needs to tell you to do it. The Lord needs to tell you. That also works for me. So if you come to me and go, this is what the Lord put on my heart, this is what you need to do you're going to get the same treatment back. Like, oh, that's great. Thanks for sharing that. I'm going to totally pray about that. That's very interesting. And I'll pray, and I'll ignore you if God doesn't speak to me. Isn't it wonderful? Freedom that operates. And it works between you and each other, and between me and you, and you and me, and parents and kids when it comes to uh, the things of the Lord, not a clean room or... You know, and if you're not paying rent, you know, what freedom do you have anyway? So, you know, if you're a freeloader, just in case anybody has any, any freeloaders, you know, you still need to minister to them. This guy was telling Paul something. Paul said, hey, listen, the Holy Spirit tells me, he says it before this, the Holy Spirit tells me in every city bonds and afflictions await. So that you came up and now everybody knows what I already... Well, yeah, the Lord, this is what's going to happen, but I'm going to Jerusalem. So he got to decide what God's plan was for his life. That's, that's very, very important. Now, uh, that really is the only foretelling kind of a thing. And uh, let's look at some other places where there's prophets mentioned. Acts 13. I just want you to see how, really, I would, I would use the word sweet, how the, the places where prophets are mentioned uh, or where the gift of prophecy is mentioned in the New Testament, it's sweet. Even Agabus coming, it's to connect the church in Jerusalem with the Antioch church. It's a gift of love. It's a warrant, you know, hey, Paul, this is coming. We care about you. We love you. Your friend, like, we don't want to see you hurt. You know, they're interpreting it a certain way, but Paul exercises his own freedom and says, no, I'm still going. Uh, look at Acts 13, verse 1. In the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, and they're named... Barnabas, Simeon, uh, who was also called Niger, and Lucius from Cyrene, and Manan, who'd been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. But notice how, what they do. What, it, what does it say about what they're doing? Verse 2, they ministered to the Lord and fasted. 
It's interesting. It doesn't say they were walking around telling people what kind of car they could buy and who they could marry. Uh, or they weren't, there wasn't a shepherding movement or a ruling over people movement. Here's this group of godly guys. They're gifted. They're ministering the word to the people. Exhortation, edification, comfort. We already saw that. But also, they're focused on the Lord. They're ministering to the Lord. And they're fasting. Uh, Acts chapter 15, we actually have a sort of a content statement. This is... Uh, in the chapter when there's the problem about circumcision and they decide to write a letter, well, with the letter, they send messengers from Jerusalem. Not just the letter, but living, living epistles, if you will, living letters. These two brothers uh, come with the letter, and uh, they're described, if you look, uh, let's look at verse 25. This is in the letter itself. It said, It seemed good to us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men to you, with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. What kind of men? Look at verse 26. Men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus. That's quite a, that's, that's quite a uh, you know, resume. We sent a couple guys. You don't have to worry about them. They've already put their necks on the chopping block. These are good guys. We therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report the same things by word of mouth. And so then the content of the letter is just two verses. So it says they sent them, verse 30, they were sent off, they came to Antioch. When they gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. When they read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. Look at verse 32. Now, Judas and Silas, themselves being prophets also, exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. So what do they do? They exhorted and they strengthened. Sounds an awful lot like 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3, where it's, edification and exhortation and comfort. They delivered the letter, and, they, and then Judas said, Paul, is it okay if I share something with them with everybody? I, you know, yeah, well, go for it. And he shared a message, and people were strengthened. They were encouraged. Silas said, can I, can I share something? I think the Lord's given me something too. He shared, and they were exhorted and, and strengthened. Now, the many words part, doesn't mean the sermon's extra long. I'm, I'm going to end. You know, we're at 8.30, so I'm not going to apply the many words. Just keep going. It's the gift of prophecy, many words. You guys are scared. No one laughed at that joke. It's like, that is not funny. We need to get, like, you're at the end, bro. Chapter 21. Hey, it's not just, it's not just boys, but boys and girls have this gift. Acts chapter 21. Remember, we already read 21. We were looking at Agabus. But look at the verse right before, they, or verse 8 and 9. On the next day, they were on their way to Jerusalem. Remember, Agabus is going to come and tie himself up and say, Paul's going to be bound. They're on their way. They came to Caesarea, and they entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and they stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. The prophecy in the book of Joel, God said, in the last days I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh and your ears. Sons and your daughters will prophesy. The old man will dream genes. The young man will have visions. Uh, indiscriminate. There's not going to be a male class, a female class. Paul talks about the office uh, for the, the teaching pastor of the church, that that uh, is not to be occupied by a woman. But the gift of prophecy operates, uh, God forbid that the only time the gift of prophecy operates is from the pulpit. What a ineffective church that would be, right? Would to God, every man and woman and boy and girl. I've seen little kids with the gift of prophecy. My sister has the gift of prophecy, and I remember when she got saved at 10 years old, that thing was in operation as a 10-year-old. I, I remember one time listening to her talk to one of her friends, the neighborhood kids, and she was fully prop. I walked up, I heard her, I was like, man, I'm going to step out of that way of that. Get out of the line of fire, man. You know, look down range. You know, like, don't, don't shoot, Chrissy. I mean, she, was, she, was, she had a word from the Lord, and she was just, a li just like a fourth grader, little girl, filled with the Holy Spirit, sharing the word of God, you know, in a, in a direct, powerful way. So uh, it's a, it's a, they had that gift. They were using it. Um, so we, we see it in the New Testament as foretelling events. Agabus and the others from Jerusalem had that message, but primarily building up and strengthening the disciples. Barnabas and Saul are also called prophets. And we see their ministry when they go back to the churches. They gathered them and they strengthened them, it says. The gift of prophecy is, 
is a building up and strengthening and encouraging gift. Um, Paul and Silas do the same thing. And then we also see them ministering to the Lord and fasting. So uh, one last thing and then we'll close. Well, actually, we'll save this. We'll save this. We're going to talk about the gift of prophecy and the prophets related to the apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastor teachers later. I had it in my notes, um, but... Uh, it'll take too much time to develop that thought. We'll save it for, we're gonna, I was going to do it later also, so we won't do it tonight. But the, what I want to end with, this is not a gift for bossing around other people. You say, okay, we got that. The reason why I'm telling you that is I saw it as a new Christian in the 80s. I saw it again at the end of the 90s, and it's come up again. And some of the names from the 80s are back still trying to do it to people. I couldn't believe it. Uh, I saw something. I forget where I read it. And I, I thought, this is such a hoax, man. This, this same group of people is trying to do this again to the body of Christ. Like, my goodness. Uh, tragic. And, and uh, So we want the gift. We just don't want the weird thing that it isn't. <laughs> we want to strengthen each other and encourage each other and build each other up. So I would encourage you, pray for this gift. Uh, ask the Lord to use you this way. Say, Lord, this is the best gift. That's the one I want then. And I don't need to know that you're doing it, Lord. It's fine. Um, but would you please give me that gift of prophecy so that I can be sharing with people and they'll be, when they're done talking to me, they'd be built up, they'd be strengthened, they'd be encouraged, they'd feel like someone came right alongside and helped them on their journey. That's the gift of prophecy. And if necessary, maybe you'd have some insight into what's coming that would kind of prepare the way for something. Father, we pray that you'll help us. Just what I just said, Lord, give us this gift. I pray that we would uh, have really, um, Lord, I just would ask. You know, you're, Paul said there was that rhetorical question list of do all speak in tongues? No. Do all interpret? No. And, but Lord, I pray that you would give, if you're not going to give it to all of us, all of us, give it to almost all of us. <laughs> Lord, we want to share your word with each other and with people who need to hear God's voice. Lord, we think about the very first thing we read in the book of Genesis is you spoke. You spoke and everything changed. And so, Lord, uh, we know in our lives you spoke. You spoke us and made us born again. We, we heard your word. Faith came alive inside of us. It was your voice, Lord. It was you speaking. And so we can't think of anything that would be mightier or more amazing or more wonderful that somehow the likes of us, we could be sharing with somebody or talking to somebody and that you would speak through us to them. But Lord, do it. <laughs> do it, Lord. Reveal yourself uh, to people through us and give us this gift and use it in our lives in a mighty way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.